Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the law and democracy and the U.S. Supreme Court. I'm Dahlia Lithwick, and that is my beat. And I should note that I have my annual January bronchitis, so I sound a little like Kermit. I'm sorry. We at the show want to wish you a happy 2024, and we enter this new year, a presidential election year, uh, with all the glittering hope and hollow-eyed panic that has become the Amicus brand. Over the week since we last checked in, former President Donald J. Trump petitioned the Supreme Court to intervene in that Colorado 14th Amendment case that had determined under Section 3, a.k.a. the Disqualification Clause, that he did indeed do an insurrection in 2021 and is thus kicked off that state's primary ballot. The state of Maine has jumped on that same train. The Supreme Court also, as our friend Jeremy Stahl predicted in a recent show, told Jack Smith to slow his role on the appellate front in a different case, that appeal from the special counsel of Donald Trump's claim to immunity will be heard by the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals January 9th. In a filing just this past weekend, Jack Smith warned that if the former president was granted broad immunity for all of his actions around January 6, 2021, there would be nothing stopping a future president from ordering the National Guard to murder his prominent critics, direct the FBI to plant evidence on a political enemy, or, quote, incite his supporters during a State of the Union address to kill opposing lawmakers, thereby hamstringing any impeachment proceeding to ensure that he remains in office unlawfully, end quote. We're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down. Anyone you want, but I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. And we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. And we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. This week, we are marking three years since January 6th, the attack on the Capitol that left five dead and many more injured. And we're also looking ahead to a year from today, at which time Donald J. Trump, if nominated, will either win the Electoral College vote and lawfully be sworn into office or, well, something else will happen. And that something is what we wanted to talk about with Jeff Charlotte, who has, with a keen eye and a very generous heart, done yeoman's reporting on what fuels that part of America that loves Trump most when he is at his worst and that has also convinced itself that God agrees with them. Later on in the show, Slate Plus members can catch up with Slate's Law of Trump chief correspondent Jeremy Stahl on the calendar of Trump's upcoming court appearances. And you'll also get to hear from Mark Joseph Stern on the biggest abortion case since Dobbs that is likely headed to the Supreme Court. If you are not a Slate Plus member, but you like to listen to our bonus content, including conversations with Jeremy and Mark, you can join at slate.com slash amicus plus. Perks of joining include listening to all of Slate podcasts, ad-free, and unlimited reading at Slate.com. Go to Slate.com slash Amicus Plus for more details. And to our dear Slate Plus members, thank you, as ever, for supporting the work we do here at the magazine. We could not do it without you. But first, to January 6th, past and future. Jeff Charlotte has spent the bulk of his career covering the intersection of religion and extreme right-wing politics, most famously in The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism, At the Heart of American Power. That book became a Netflix documentary in the first Trump administration. His latest book, The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War, was published by Norton last March and became an instant New York Times bestseller. The book draws from his writing as he traveled around America, 
meeting with, as the Washington Post put it, quote, furious people in forgotten places, all of them convinced that civil war of some sort is in the offing, end quote. This book is also one of the most stunning pieces of writing I've read in a very long time. And Jeff Charlotte is, in a deep sense, I think, the poet laureate of the tearing apart of America. Jeff, we have been waiting and waiting to have you on this podcast, but this strange interregnum between Jan 6, 2021 and whatever is coming in January of 2025 seemed like absolutely the perfect moment to check in with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dahlia. And I, I'm so delighted to talk to you and disappointed that we are because the greatest hope for this book that... Uh, by now, people would have been so bored by this and would be so past, and I would have been deemed absolutely hysterical. And unfortunately, now I'm wondering about uh, that slow in my subtitle, <laughs> how long it's going to stay slow. Always good to start ominous. Excellent work. Um, <laughs> so Jeff, one of the things I wanted to ask you, uh, you write about a civil war that is either coming or not coming, and it's spearheaded by the people who either believe that the words civil war are a metaphor or really not a metaphor. And, and so much of your work, it seems to me, is about these spaces between reality and imagination and dreams and hopes and metaphors. And so that makes it very hard for me as a reader, as much as for the Trump supporters you profile, to ever really pin down whether we're talking about a real civil war or about a bunch of symbols and hopes. And I find myself wondering, are we still here in 2024, stuck in the game that we were playing throughout 2016, where we have to determine whether to take the threats you're describing seriously versus literally? It, it. I mean, that's an astonishing fact to me. Is that in 2024, uh, we see some press coverage that's doing better, but a lot of it seems to have gone back not to 2020, but to 2016, repeating the same mistakes of 2016, not paying attention to language. And and I would say to listeners, for every kind of outrageous. Trump comment or Trump supporter comment that you've heard, there's quite a bit more that the press hasn't been covering. And, and you know, that's sort of what I write about. I began going to rallies in 2016. I, I was first traveling for the New York Times magazine. I made a deal. I said, okay, I'm not going to go as press. I mean, I'll identify myself, but I don't want to stay in the metal press pen. If you've never been to a Trump rally, and it's hard to believe that any of your listeners haven't, but um, it'll be a big arena or something like this. And in the middle, Right in the middle will be the press pen. And Trump, uh, a veteran of, of wrestling, knows how to use that as a prop. So at some point in the rally, he'll say, look at those scum, look at those evil people. And people have a great time turning around and flying the bird and, you know, to hell with you, CNN, and, and so on. And then they go back to the show. Well, I didn't want to be part of the prop because I also wanted to see what was going on. And the first thing I would say I'd notice is like that literally seriously. First rally I went to was in Youngstown, Ohio in early 2016. And it was open. I've spent years covering the religious right by one of the fiercest, hardest religious right preachers I've ever heard. Not a major figure, just sort of a, a little local warlord of Christian nationalist theology. I, I can't believe what I'm hearing because I hadn't seen this reported. I'm looking back at the press. They must be writing this down because this is news. They're looking at their phones. Because we all know Donald Trump's not religious. We know he's not serious about that. And there it is. Well, now here we are years later with so many of those Christian nationalist goals achieved, most notably Dobbs. And we understand that that line between literal and serious is kind of a, a fetish of, of liberalism that does not apply. And I think that goes to civil war too. If you cover the right, you've been hearing civil war rhetoric forever. and it was always pretty fringe. After January 6, 2021, I started hearing historians and political scientists who are necessarily cautious, you know, despite the, the popular idea of wild-eyed radical academics, historians know that history moves slowly. But now suddenly they're saying, hey, wait a minute, some of the conditions of civil war are here. 
the literal conditions were there, but how did these people understand it? Of course, it's a metaphor, even with the news from Gaza, from Ukraine, an American, unless you have fought in a war or were born in another country, you have no idea what civil war is. You're thinking about Red Dawn, the 1980s movie where football players take down the Soviet Union. You're thinking about civil war movies. And I think that's actually a lot of resistance too. On the liberal side is like, oh, well, it's not going to be the blue and the gray. No, no, it's not. The slow civil war, and I do mean slow, is the simmer of violence and potential violence that's happening now. Uh, hopefully didn't, people didn't have this in their schoolyard uh, days, but uh, if you did, if you ever had that kind of bully who would cock his fist and pretend he's going to punch you and not, or maybe worse, if you've been in a domestic violence situation and the man who punches the wall beside his spouse to show what he could do, that is a form of violence. And I think... That is a literal form of violence that we are in. So it's metaphor, it's the fantasy of the movies, and and, and it's the, the, real, the real deal, too. And as you say, there's room for improvement, but for there's, unfortunately right now, room for it to get a lot worse, too. On that same theme, Jeff, I think January 6, 2021, it sure looked like the start of what could be a civil war to many of us. This was, you know, a moment that we, we, we teetered into something and then we came back from the brink. It was also a moment at which I think even the most fervent uh, Trumpists and, you know, most Republicans publicly were trying to call off the dogs. But it feels as though we've evolved into something quite different in the three years since. And at least according to polling from the Washington Post, University of Maryland, more than seven in 10 Republicans say way too much is being made of January 6th, and it is, quote, time to move on. And I, I find myself wondering what you take from the fact that to the extent that we had a preview of what that civil war that we're kind of dancing around might look like, everybody, as you said, is either bored by it or trying to play it down. I mean, more than 1,200 people have been charged in connection with that attempt to interrupt the certification of the election. It's a serious thing. And yet, it just feels as though it's in the way, 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 way past and certainly the vibe I get now, including Mike Johnson releasing all this body cam footage, uh, suggests that we're both minimizing it and weirdly both sizing it. <laughs> both sizing it, yeah. All right, so here's like a little bit of good news because uh, uh, this is a hopeful book, really. I'm not worried about another January 6th. I don't think there will be another January 6th. My travels amongst, you know, a, a number of the people who were involved – some people who uh, have been prosecuted, you know, and in the book, I, I, I meet a militia commander in Marinette, Wisconsin, walk into his home. It's an arsenal playing on loop in a corner is the video. He's got hours and hours of video he took at the Capitol. You know, this question of weapons, of course he was carrying. He said, I wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't go to Washington without a gun because he has this imagination of it as, as a very dangerous place. He thought I might be an FBI agent, but other than that, he's not been bothered with all his footage. So that's all out there, but he would never go again. And I think movements change. One thing that may be useful to understand how January 6th plays and that, that sort of uh, initial step back is to understand the Trump rhetoric. And I sort of write about this as a move that he does is joking, not joking. And again, it's like that schoolyard bully who, who pretends he's going to punch you and then says, just joking. And then does it again until you get that sort of normalized terror. And you see that playing out as Trump introduces these ideas over the years. I'm the chosen one. I am the chosen one. Somebody no, I'm just it. joking. Well, but now it's a commonplace on the Christian right, especially that Trump is divinely anointed. Or uh, maybe I'm going to stay for 12 more years. I told you he's a dictator. We've been saying he will not give up power. Under no circumstances will he give up power. He intends to serve at least two more terms. Hershey, Pennsylvania, I was at a rally and he says, tomorrow the press will say, but I'm just joking. Or maybe I'm not. He wants 12 more years. They start shouting now, 12 more years. 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 Now it's a commonplace that I'm going to be dictator on day one. 
<laughs> I love this guy. He says, you're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than day one. Joking, not joking. So too, January 6th was that move of normalizing the possibility of violence, trying it out. Think more of January 6th as a trial balloon for the exercise of state power. And then when you connect that to something like a document I don't think is getting reported enough about now is called uh, Project 2025 spearheaded by Heritage Foundation involving 75 other of the real heavy hitters uh, across the spectrum, many of which right-wing groups wouldn't normally work together to have a plan in place for that day one dictatorship of Trump. It's 900 pages, agency by agency. They're recruiting you know, lawyers and so on. And it includes the kind of institutionalization of January 6th. Not least of which, by the way, of course, is Trump saying, if I get in, I'm going to pardon these guys and I'm going to apologize to them. And I mean full pardons with an apology, just to many an apology. So I think it's still very real, but the way that it does seem in the past and I think is relevant is the mistake we can make is to think, well, that was a terrible day that we must never let happen again. Yes, correct. On the other hand, we're already in scarier territory than January 6th. We need to deal with the threats ahead as well as behind. I don't want to sound like Mike Johnson or something. Let's move ahead. Let's move on. This is not a crime scene. This is an ongoing crime. I'm hearing you say two things that I, I feel are through lines in your book. One is the guy who goes to throw a punch and then pulls back because it's the way you talk about guns throughout the book, right? Folks who are, you know, have a pretend gun and a fake gun or their fake guns lying around at home. I mean, this is all a move that is intended to train the receiver of the message almost more than it is to, uh, you know, actually uh, commit violence, but it changes the footing. I think the other thing you're saying, because I was going to ask you about Project 2025, is that to the extent that January 6th still exists in the mind of some of the folks who are building toward the next thing. It's as a like, not we put this behind us and do it better, but like, this is the map. Like, this is actually what we want. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it has religious meaning. And so if we look at it theologically and you look at the first Trump campaigns in 2016, it's a kind of a prosperity gospel. We're going to be winning so much, you're going to want it to stop. By 2020, I describe it as a kind of a Gnostic gospel uh, and keeping with that ancient Christian conspiracy theory, basically. It's a heresy. Um, this idea of secret knowledge from within, the deep state, the conspiracies that Trump has been peddling that he himself starts, I think, I would argue, actually starts to believe himself. January 6th marks theologically a really frightening escalation into an age of martyrs. And Trump had been trying to build up martyrs. You'd see it as rallies. He'd recite names of people killed by undocumented people. And it should be noted, that's a community that has lower rates of crime than citizens. But yes, of course, there's some criminals amongst them. And, and a lot of the crowd would know the names, but they needed the martyrdom first of January 6th, a white woman killed for the cause, and then the martyrdom of all the, the January 6th singers, which probably your listeners don't realize had a hit single with Trump that would play at his rallies of singing from prison. Now you have this age of martyrs, and that's it can always be present. You don't really have to deal with the date. I think the guns are are worth understanding in that same way. Because you said it's just sort of like imaginary violence, real violence, which is it? I've been doing this reporting for years. I saw more guns driving back and forth across the United States than I have for a long time. And I've had the, you know, the, the misfortune as a journalist to be in sticky encounters with guns before, but never at churches before. <laughs> um, now, and in Omaha, Nebraska, gunman says, get out. Uh, in Yuba City, California, they've got Tuesday night is militia training night. Some people may have seen this because a little clip went viral of the church presenting uh, General Mike Flynn, a full QAnon kook who could come back into the Trump 
administration presenting him with a customized AR-15. That clip went viral. If you keep watching, you saw the pastor who I got to meet also presented with a customized AR-15 inscribed with Joshua 1.9. It's called the battle verse. It's also on merchandise you can get at, uh, well, Lauren Boebert's restaurant shooters has uh, sadly gone out of business, but they used to sell Joshua 1.9 stuff all across the country. The book of Joshua I'm getting in the weeds here, but for the Sunday school folks, they're like, yeah, yeah, of course. The book of Joshua, you know, Jericho marching around seven times. Isn't that nice? Now, remember that January 6th is preceded by the Jericho March. Go back to your scripture and see what happens in Jericho. It's a complicated story. Complicated in the sense that we like to have some kind, if we're believers, good relationship with God. But God, it's it's a genocidal story. God says to, to Joshua, the biblical hero, I want you to go in and kill everybody inside. Everybody. Wipe them out. That's Jericho. That's a Jericho march. That's Joshua 1.9 on an AR-15. That's a promise. Now, I've got so much good news here. And I think about Shooter's Grill. I went to Shooter's Grill, uh, Lauren Bobert's restaurant in the town of Rifle, Colorado. And this is what it's actually called. And Shooter's is like Hooters, but with guns. It's uh, waitresses and sort of short cutoff jeans, but they've got a sidearm, a Glock or something. It's open carry. And I went there one day for lunch. Um, I had a Guac 9 burger. You could also get a Swiss and Wesson. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, it's sort of funny, but like the temptation is always to sort of like roll our eyes and sort of saying, on the other hand, let's remember th- that was an armory. That was a place full of guns. There's a militia man that I end up talking to, and he thinks like almost everyone I meet, the Civil War is coming. The answer was always, it's coming, and it's, it's what a sorrow, or it's coming, and I can't wait. He was more in the sorrow category, but he definitely thought it was coming. And I said, well, what's going to kick it off? Because he was saying things were terrible. The cities were under foreign control. He believed the Democrats were eating children. You know, I'm like, so wait a minute. If you think Democrats are eating children, what is it going to take to get you in the streets? You guys are not as active. And he says, well, if they come to take our guns, ah, good news, because you and I know they're not going to take those guns. So there is a little bit of here's the gun. Here's what happens. But even that part of the slow civil war I think of is the guys with guns who line up outside schools and libraries and bars holding drag brunches. And they line up there with their guns and they don't shoot. So I guess everything's okay, right? I mean, I was just reading a little while ago about a guy who's posted up with his AR-15 by a school bus stop and the kids just have to go to school and he's not guarding them. He wants that school to know that he is there. That's terror. You don't need to put a person in restraints if you're standing there with a gun. They will restrain themselves. And and I think of that as the, the slow civil war and the purpose of the gun, the violence that is both imaginary and real at the same time. We are going to take a break to hear from some of our sponsors. As a major research institution, Arizona State University offers the most online bachelor's degree programs, along with world-class faculty and dedicated support. Discover why ASU is ranked number one in innovation for nine consecutive years. Tap to learn more. Hey, this is Mary Harris, host of Slate's daily news podcast, What Next? Slate's mission has always been to cut through the noise, boldly and provocatively. This election season and Supreme Court term are no different. Important coverage like this, though, it would not be possible without the support of our Slate Plus members. So I'm going to invite you to join us with a special offer. You can try your first three months for only 15 bucks. That is five bucks a month for your first three months of uninterrupted ad-free listening on every Slate podcast, member-exclusive episodes and segments of your favorite shows like Amicus and the Political Gap Fest, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. Best of all, you'll be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism and analysis as we make sense of the news like no one else can. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcasts plus. Again, that is three months for only 15 bucks. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. Let's return now to my conversation with Jeff Charlotte, author of The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. You 
I think just teed up my next question when you talked about, if I can keep calling it the both sidesing of January 6, 2021, because now there's widespread belief that FBI agents instigated it. And it's just absolutely the case that the folks who were harmed or arrested on January 6 are, as you said, martyrs and heroes. And you've pointed to some of the symbols. You've talked about the prison choir. I, I want to talk about Ashley Babbitt. By the way, who shot Ashley Babbitt? Who shot Ashley Babbitt? Who? Who shot Ashley Babbitt? We all saw the hand. We saw the gun. You draw the title of the book from your chapter on him, her, I think if you're not in the spaces you were covering, and I know at Shooters, you know, you're drawing folks into conversation about Ashley Babbitt. For most of us, we think of Ashley Babbitt as a kind of peripheral, very tragic story of a young woman shot and killed trying to break into the Capitol on January 6th. But in some sense, your chapter on her doesn't just hold her up as this kind of very powerful symbol of martyrology, but she also is like in a deep way, Jeff, still alive, right? This lives on. This animates so much of the thinking. And there's this deeply, I think you're right, theological transformation from Ashley as somebody who you know, was shot trying to enter the Capitol into someone who is a full-on religious, symbolic figure in her own right. Yeah, absolutely. And I should say for secular listeners, um, when I speak of these martyrs and Ashley Babbitt as a martyr, some people, uh, and I, I, I get this response, she's not a martyr, she's a terrorist. And the answer is, yes, and, you know, I mean, um, uh, you you don't get to choose another movement's martyrs, but even the word martyr itself means witness, and and particularly one who suffers and witness for their cause or dies, and that she did. Her cause was unjust. She was pursuing what is arguably terrorism. She was not unarmed, as the right claims to this day. That's the evidence photo of her knife on the cover. If you look closely at it, you can see it's dated January 6th. And sometimes I, I, I get to talking to January 6th enthusiasts and they say, well, that's just a small knife. And it is. It's, you know, it's a, and I'm like, well, try taking that into a courtroom or on an airplane and uh, explain to the TSA agent what a small knife that is. She was there to storm the Capitol, as she put it, to be boots on the ground. She was a sort of perfect martyr in a sense. And, and if you were watching January 6th that day, we saw almost real time her get killed. Here's this small woman and a crowd of men. She's right up at front. She's wearing a Trump flag, like a cape and an American flag backpack. And she's got this long blonde hair. She's this California beach girl. She's this not who you think she is. She's from Southern California, Democrat most of her life. Obama was her second favorite president. She was sort of thought of herself as a laid back person. The the sort of surfer shaka symbol, thumb and finger was her, her style. She was a Christian nationalist, but her scripture was the Coen Brothers movie, The Big Lebowski, which, you know, if you're, wait a minute, was that a right-wing movie? No, it wasn't. Um, but she could repurpose it to her meaning. And she had fallen in love 2016, she does her first uh, tweet, hashtag love Trump on Halloween of 2016, and she just fell in love with Trump. And that's the undertow that I sort of saw. Here was a woman, I think a lot of people dismissed her too, because we would look at her and we'd see, you know, in the initial coverage, she had been a military veteran, but she hadn't really gone very far, 14 years you dig a little deeper, she hadn't gone far because she was the kind of person who she talked back to her superiors because she stood up for her fellows. She, you know, she had a stiff spine. She was an incredible debt. And there's this kind of sort of liberal like, oh, well, she's incredible debt. She's a loser. And, you know, it's, it's almost sort of like a mirror of Trump. She was a woman who lacked the language of neoliberalism or the structural language to explain the crisis in which she was in. Trump told her that her anger was, in fact, love for her country. And after years of trying to struggle against that, trying to be a better person, it was just easy to give in to that undertow. And it carries her right into the Capitol. She leaps up into a window. And we see in that video the hands of a police officer 
and he shoots her as she's trying to make it over the barricade to where the members of Congress are. And the hands are the hands of a black man. And as soon as I saw that, I had a plan for the book. I mean, January 6th sort of upended my plan for the book. And, and Ashley Babbitt became, you know, she's about half the book. Or, or not Ashley Babbitt, following the ghost of Ashley Babbitt around the country, talking to people who are sort of haunted by her. But as soon as I saw that, I'm like, that's really one of the oldest American stories. I don't mean the truth of black man kills white woman. I mean the lynching myth of black man kills white woman. I looked at that and I saw the template of, of Hollywood, Birth of a Nation. D.W. Griffiths, 1915, the first movie screened in the White House by Woodrow Wilson, who loved it. The movie which features a white woman chased by an evil black man who must leap to her death rather than give up her white womanly virtue. And so then she must be avenged. The movie was based on a novel called The Klansmen, as in the Ku Klux Klan, and they were the heroes. Um, so I was like, oh, here's the old lynching story, but it's been remade for the present. And it's been joined by another old, old story, which is stabbed in the back. And when you were starting to speak about Ashley, uh, I hope you won't edit this out. You, you, you just, uh, you, there was a slip of the tongue and you for a moment misgendered her as he. And, and that's just right. Because that's how she functioned. She was a veteran too, right? People have paintings in their houses of Ashley in her uniform, sometimes with an avenging angel with a sword behind her. People say, we are Ashley Babbitt and so on. She was a soldier. She had been a Capitol guardian. Her job had been to defend the Capitol. To liberals in the left, we say, what? Well, then what a traitor. To them, they say, she was defending the Capitol and that black man shot her stabbed in the back. This was one of the central sort of myths of fascism. There's a single German word for it, as there is for so many things, um, which I can't pronounce. So she was both. She sort of gendered both male and as female. And as female, it was fascinating. On the very day of, she was a, a early 30s, 125, 130 pounds, but they needed her to be more innocent. So they started aging her backwards. Not white woman, white girl. She was a, a, maybe in her 20s or one pastor on video says, I think just about 16. And it's a great weight loss program. She gets smaller and smaller. Representative Paul Gosar, the, um, I would argue, pro-Civil War congressman from Arizona, puts out a tweet, hashtag one more in the name of love. Appropriating the U2 song, Pride in the Name of Love. No, it's not a right-wing song. It's a song for Martin Luther King. To me, this is actually one of the things I really want those of us, liberals, leftists, never Trumpers, everyone who doesn't want this fascism. And a word I use advisedly, and we can argue about it, or I don't know where you are on that, but authoritarianism to come is to understand that we already know some things aren't going to save us. You know, this idea of the youth will save us, right? Well, now then we see these polls and like, oh, it turns out bad news. The youth are <laughs> moving toward Trump in ever greater numbers. Um, the courts will save us. And I'll leave that. That's your authority, but I, I'm pretty skeptical. Or our good taste will save us. Culture will save us. And you too, the big Lebowski, we can go on. This martyr mythology, it can absorb all the same culture that we share and turn it to these other ends. And that's what I was really fascinated by. The whiteness of Ashley Babbitt, the martyr myth of Ashley Babbitt, and the way that militia guy I met at Shooter's Grill, he says, yeah, I met Ashley Babbitt once. And he had not met Ashley Babbitt. I actually want to pull on one thing, one theme that you have kind of fainted at a couple of times that I feel like embodies so much of your thinking, which is this, there is a failure to talk about structural democracy. We can't do it. And so we talk about faith instead. And what you have just said about the martyrology of January 6th and the sort of lifting up of Trump to religious status is all of a piece with what you compare to this kind of QAnon, do your own research. I want to note when Mike Johnson released all those 44,000 hours of video that was meant to say, like, really, do your own research. Yeah. That's what he said, yeah. right? Let the, let the people figure out whether the FBI were the bad guys. You know, we're going to blur the faces of the insurrection 
perfectionists so that they can't be hauled off into court. And this theme of do your own research twinned with this religious valence you're talking about brings you to the Gnostics. And I would just love for you to marry those two ideas because it seems like that's a central fusion here. Structural democracy, too hard to explain, too hard to understand. We can't put it on a t-shirt. We can't etch it into our guns. And so we will use this religious locution of, if you do your own research, you will meet me in the dream, in the religious yeah. fervor where I sit. That's the move, right? Yeah. And one of the things that has struck me as I've moved into writing about the populist right, and I used to write about more of a sort of an elite right wing, uh, you know, the, the organizations and the Washington players and such, is to understand that in a very small D sense, they're experiencing what feels like democracy. They really are. Do your own research. I'm sitting here at a college. I've got a library I can go to. I've had all the access. I've been trained how to do research and so on. I might take it for granted. A lot of these people like Ashley Babbitt, known as the intellectual in her circle, and, and people, ha ha, no, because Ashley Babbitt, don't laugh at that. She spent time. She did learn a lot. Uh, that's how she convinced some of her friends to vote for Obama. That's how she convinced some of them to vote for Trump. You go into that space and you experience this great kind of liberation. Here's the internet making this library real. You get to enter the invisible archive. But long comes a figure like Trump or a movement like Trumpism. And it understands that in that space, without that language of structural democracy, which we can talk about, and, you know, arguably the Democrats have, have advocated as a public narrative, um, whether or not they're still doing the work, it's not part of the story. The right will fill it. Uh, I was reporting on, um, a previous book of mine, uh, a movement called battle cry, these huge three day teen Christian rock festivals and so on. Very, very militant. But it also, they would come out, they'd bring a, a cowhide and they would brand it. And they would say, that's what Coca-Cola is doing to you. That's what Oakley is doing to you. Do you want that? Do you want to be a slave to corporations? And I'm sitting there, I'm saying, well, what? Wait a minute. This is the right? This is that lefty magazine, Adbusters. It gave us Occupy Wall Street. Except Adbusters didn't have the reach. They didn't have an audience of 70,000 at a weekly concert and so on. Um, they were filling that now with, you've got the critique. You've got the recognition that you have problems with capitalism, with the way it's structured. The democracy is not really functioning. The critique is real. The loss that we associate, some people say, well, what? No, it's just these people losing their white privilege. That's, that's real loss. It's loss that should happen. But there's white folks who experienced a certain kind of expectation and they feel in some ways an erosion of that. Good. They should. We're not filling that space and saying, here's how that works. Instead, do your own research. Oh, oh, great replacement theory. Well, that seems to explain it. That seems to explain it. And here's 8,000 people coming up. I see these pictures on the caravan from Mexico. I guess it's real. I think I sort of first learned this in a different authoritarian context. I was uh, uh, writing in that same book about a, um, an anarchist journalist named Brad Will, who was killed by Mexican police while he was covering a, a strike in Oaxaca and um, really he actually was filming and you can slow the film down. You can actually see the bullet come from the gun. Nobody was ever prosecuted for it. Um, and the Mexican government would offer one story and then another story, and then another story. The point wasn't to replace the truth with a separate thing. The point was that, you know, do your own research. I'll meet you there in this space. And I think that's what authoritarianism has understood about the do your own research movement, which has real democratic value, but absent a public voice for structural democracy that's going to slip right into conspiracy, right into QAnon. So I'm hearing you say, and this is, I think, very profound to understand on a show that's nominally about the law, right, and the courts. Um, and I'm hearing you say, 
if um, the left cannot create a compelling st structural story about the language of constitutional democracy, the right will bring in a much better story about aspiration and religion, and that that kind of comes to fill the space. And it really answers for me a lot of questions about, you know, uh, how abortion, you know, became what it is at the Supreme Court and the ways in which it's just a better, it's a better story, and it's a story that everyone can participate in on their own terms, right? It requires no expertise and no mediation. But I think, um, you know, I want to sort of just point out, you know, my, this is a show about the law. You're not a lawyer. Your book uh, is about not law. Yeah. It's a book about unlaw. Um, lawlessness is central to uh, all the thinking you've done uh, on the religious right, and as you say, um, on well, no, uh, I would, uh, I would actually, I would say that that's actually a change that happened. And you know, uh, you mentioned early on uh, this book I'd written called "The Family," you know, the Netflix documentary, and uh, it would always drive me nuts when I wrote that book that people would say, "Oh, well, Charlotte says there's this conspiracy." And I'm like, "Well, not here." Like the 15 places in the book, I say, "Look, this is not a conspiracy. Conspiracy is a word that has a meaning." In a kind of glib way, these people are not breaking laws. They're legislators. They're making laws. Now, I don't like those laws, but they are participating in it, and they're still seeing the law as an instrument for moving things along. So like the Stupak Pitts Amendment, which was a, a you know one of the steps on the way to Dobbs, a Democrat and a Republican who'd long been collaborating through this uh, Christian nationalist organization, make an amendment to sort of soften the way to, to, to a, a road road. That's how they were doing it. And there was ways to fight them there, right? But yeah, I like what you say, this is unlaw. And I think that's the, the sort of the dilemma of how to resist this because we are not debating rule of law. This is a movement that from the populist, and I don't write as much about these, but um, my friend Catherine Joyce has, has written extensively about the post-liberal movement, including legal scholars who are sort of thinking in this post-democratic way of, hmm, maybe we can have a, a system of law that is kind of post-law in a way, right? That's Project 2025 to me too. It's, it is a legal document in a way about undoing the rule of law. But you said, if we don't have a good story, the right will come in. I think it's a little clever than that. They don't have to. So, you know, one of the chapters, uh, I, I I was in Wisconsin when when Roe fell, and, and Wisconsin became the only, you know, so-called blue state in which abortion in the sort of gray area seemed to become immediately fully illegal, reverting back to 1849 law. And in fact, a friend of mine was engaged in IVF and was with her doctor at the time. And the doctor came in and says, I can't keep treating you. Our lawyers advised us, we're not even sure if we can do this. So I started traveling around uh, and talking to people who were enthusiastic about this, not the big activists in the streets. I just drove around, you know, oh, hi, what you doing? A man on the street, except men and women all over the state, just in small towns and talking and so on. And I discovered amongst anti-abortion people, so many fascinating theories of human reproductive biology. <laughs> um, I mean, these people really didn't take their health class. They don't know how bodies work. And so each one of them, they were so absurd, you could dismiss as French. They didn't actually have really Fox talking points. Their ideas seem kooky until you start seeing fringe here, fringe there. That's on law, is that my fringe is as good as your fringe. And together, you know, how many different crazy ideas were in the mob on January 6th, all coming together. Those fringes combine and it feels democratic. It feels democratic in a way to them that law doesn't. And so, you know, again, but how do you do this? I don't know. I'm counting on, on folks like you to do this because I also think the left now, and I, oh, I'm going to get it for this. Uh, the left has become skeptical of rule of law. And I just want to say, please, please, <laughs> um, let's look at some history. It, the rule of law is so dull and inadequate. <laughs> um, I'm not saying go slow, as people told Martin Luther King. I'm saying, don't burn it down um, because they've got all the matches. Um, they really do. Let's take a short break. 
and more now with Jeff Charlotte. What has been a sort of animating question on this show for, uh, I want to say, at least the year, you know, we've had conversations with Ian Basson and Eric Posner about how it's possible that all these criminal indictments and two states affirmatively declaring the former president an insurrectionist and civil lawsuits, a, a jury finding that he's a sexual abuser, and it does nothing to diminish the former president's charm. In fact, seems to to sort of only uh, elevate it for all of the sort of mythological reasons you, you posited at the beginning. I, I'm thinking of a section in your book where you talk not about law, but about fact. But I think it's so apt for what you've just described. You, you wrote, quote, it's satisfying when an expert flattens a false claim. That's how so many of us believe we'll resist the undertow of civil war, fact-checking our way back to solid ground. Such connections miss the point, you write. You can't fact check a myth. I think you're saying you also can't litigate a myth. I mean, the lashing of the rule of law to facts and facticity is the thing that we keep saying is going to save us. And so we file another lawsuit and another lawsuit, and we watch them like they're reality TV, right? It's the alternative to the carnival barker of Trumpian reality TV. But I think what you're saying is law doesn't necessarily, and I stipulate the rule of law is what gets uh, democracy to the other side. But the using of legal tools to try to unbuild the sort of galactic church of Donald Trump may not be the way we get there. That's, I think, what you're saying. Yeah. Well, in particular, we mentioned Gnosticism, this ancient Christian heresy. And if people out there have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's that's where the Gnostic Gospels come from. There's a great book by Elaine Pagels, a scholar. Uh, the Gnostic Gospels are not a right-wing idea, but there's a bastardized American Gnosticism, a belief in secrets and conspiracy. The Gnostics believe that the church was kind of a false front and it wasn't the real deal. And the real believers, even God himself, wasn't the real thing. And that the officials of the church, the bureaucrats, the Gnostics called them uh, waterless canals. And this, by the way, is the Trumpers' way of explaining, well, how, you know, Bill Barr, but Trump appointed him himself. Well, waterless canal, a bureaucrat. It's a deep state theology in this American sense. It doesn't matter what you prove with facts. That that passage that you read um, comes from, I was at a church in Yuba City. Uh, uh, this is the church with the Mike Flynn gun. And, and um, uh, because I'd come from an Ashley Babbitt rally, they agreed to speak to me, although they don't normally permit media. And it was a three-hour talk by a speaker who get, brought us the news. Um, great news. Everyone cheered. A big sort of, a, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people, somewhat diverse crowd, plenty of college graduates and so on. Not only was Hillary Clinton going to be executed, she already had been. Um, and what you see now is on green screens. And did you know that Trump is still president? He is the 19th president of the United States because every president since Abraham Lincoln has been illegal, according to this reading. And you could see people sort of like, but wait a minute, it says 45 on his hat. How could it be? That doesn't matter. You're in the word, to borrow from that kind of charismatic Christian parlance. You're in the word. And I say, how crazy it is that I end up at your church, you know, and I come all the way across the country to this, and, and this is, oh, no, it's not. There are no coincidences. He says, did you know there's no coincidence, word for coincidence in the Bible? So, a friend of mine, Seth Sanders, is a scholar of biblical languages at UC Davis just down the road, and I called him up, and he's like, um, nope, yeah, sure there is. <laughs> um, and Great. Well, uh, you can imagine I called that pastor and he said, my God, I've been wrong. I'm going to disband the militia. Um, nah, waterless canals, lies, right? And so I think that is the, the problem of trying to fact check a myth is not going to be enough. At the same time, I'm a popular front guy and I use that term. And I know in the 1930s, it comes from the Communist Party. Although when you speak of it today, some of my left friends consider me a hopeless liberal for saying popular front because I'm saying, hey, it's all hands on deck. The lawsuits and the protests. You feel like, hey, I, my, my calling is to uh, pursue this legal end. My phone calling is to go through every Trump claim and say what's wrong have at it. You say, my calling is to uh, dress up all in black and go out in the black block. And if you really want to get your head knocked in by Proud Boys, 
I'm anti-violence myself, but I'm not going to tell you not to do because the reality is one thing Trump has made clear is we don't know yet how to stop Trumpism. So I, I can't tell you this is the way, that's the way, all hands on deck. When I say we can't fact check a myth, I don't mean that we should abandon the attempt to try. We keep doing that, but we also work on other fronts. May I ask your indulgence for one last question sure. before I let you go? And um, uh, I just uh, feel like I need to to say that we are, you know, folks are going to hear this Saturday morning first thing on January 6th of 2024. What are you taking from what we know now, good and bad, about January 6th, 2021? that can shape the way we think about this election that is barreling down on us, that at least in the minds of so many of the folks that you've met has already apparently been stolen. Yeah. I mean, well, one thing, I'll, 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 let me speak again for the rule of law, because I will say that that prosecution of the 1200 uh, and counting uh, January Sixers, while yes, it's produced this sort of martyr class and a, a living martyr class, because, you know, now you don't have to die to be a martyr. The FBI asked you a question about where you were on January 6th and you're a martyr. And let's go even a little bit further. If now we're living, someone gave you a sideways glance at work because they saw your Trump sticker. I'm persecuted for my faith. I'm I'm a martyr, um, and and I'm part of the martyr age. The fact is, with each of the indictments, the press would sort of gather around like this time we're going to be ready. No, this it's already too late, folks. The paranoia within that broader movement is so vast. The effect of saying it was all feds. Uh, which of course it wasn't, is that now everybody's a Fed until proven otherwise. And look, historically, this is how the U.S. government crushes social movements. I'm not going to complain here. I don't want them to abuse the law. They can't abuse the law, but they can prosecute people who broke the law. And if that makes people paranoid, oh gosh, wait a minute, you mean if I break the law, I could actually? No, no, you're just kidding. Because, because um, you know, uh, George Riley, a J6er I met in Sacramento, who, um, uh, sadly unknown, everyone knows the guy who puts his, his feet up on uh, Nancy Pelosi's desk. And he says, why don't I get my credit? Because he pulled down his pants and rubbed his ass on Nancy Pelosi's desk. And uh, he was prosecuted. He didn't care. He wanted to brag about it. He just talked and talked and talked. He said he was like, a, there's a movie, again. This is all in the fantasy world. A movie called 300, this sort of gore fest, CGI gore fest, the myth of the Spartans. 300 brave warriors fight off a Persian horde. And if you want to project onto that whiteness versus another, you are reading it correctly, even as George Riley describes himself as a Native American Jew. He's a Jew for Jesus. He says he's a, 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 a Native American. He went to the Capitol wearing what he described as war paint. He said, I'm taking back my land and so on. It didn't matter. The myth of whiteness had consumed him. He says like in 300, he says, I'm the last one left alive to tell the tale. One man of the 300 survives. Well, and I wanted to say like, well, George, actually every Everybody but Ashley, you're all left telling the tale and you won't stop talking about it, right? Well, George Riley has since been convicted, right? George Riley did lose his positions within the regional Republican Party. So the rule of law can do something. It can't do the whole thing. We need we need the press to, can I, I, your final language, step the f up. What is going on with this back to 2016? We can look at reporters who are doing real work. We need local press, the steady die off of papers, the million little Trumps. Uh, my school district here in, in New Hampshire, our district is being targeted by a wealthy local family with resources that is worried about the trans menace. That's our little local Trump. Moms for Liberty, their death has been uh, prematurely declared. That movement's not over by a long shot. Um, there's a little scandal, and the Amer Americans love a little scandal, and they say, ha, 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 someone got caught with their pants down, and that's that. But no, a bunch did get defeated electorally. It can be done. It isn't automatically done. It isn't done by saying, Reason will save us. Youth will save us. Changing demographics won't save us. The courts alone won't save us. So I do think 
on January 6, 2024, I think there's a real possibility of the F word, fascism, in the true historical sense. And we could do your own research about what that means. I'm not just calling people I don't like fascist. But I also think that one of the central lies of fascism is inevitability. Um, nothing is inevitable, right? I think we can build a movement to either stop it or maybe, and maybe this is enough to get through it. That's my hope. And I mean the book to be a hopeful way. Like this is, this is, uh, maybe we have to go through it further, but I do think we can. I, I love the image you painted right at the top of the answer there, January 6, 2021, where everybody who died is still alive and all the people who are still alive are dead. It's just flawless. Jeff Charlotte has spent the bulk of his career as a journalist covering the intersection of religion and extreme right-wing politics, most famously in The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power. His latest book, which came out last spring, is The Undertone, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. Jeff, I cannot thank you enough for going on this journey with me today. I wish you a very happy new year, and I thank you so much for your work. Thank you, Dahlia. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus. Thank you so much for listening in, and thank you so much for your letters and your questions. You can always keep in touch at amicus at slate.com, or you can find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Sarah Burningham is Amicus's senior producer. Our producer is Patrick Fort. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate. Susan Matthews is Slate's executive editor. And Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. We'll be back with another episode of Amicus next week. And until then, hang on in there.